At around 4 a.m. on Wednesday, April 17th, hundreds of protesters occupied the South Lawn of Columbia University in New York City. The Gaza Solidarity Encampment came as the culmination of months of tension at universities across the United States, as the growing number of student-led protests for Palestine came up against accusations of anti-Semitism. Over the next two weeks, the Columbia University Encampment faced mass arrests, suspensions, and evictions, before eventually being cleared on April 30th. But by then, students around the world had joined the push. Within the U.S., as of May 6th, there had been pro-Palestinian student protests in 45 out of 50 states, on almost 140 campuses. University encampment protests have occupied campuses in Latin America, Australia, Japan, the Middle East, and across Europe. So much of the news about these encampment protests is told by the universities and not the students themselves. Stories focus on the clashes and confrontations, but there's a deeper story here, one about resilience, unity, and the relentless pursuit of justice. Today on Pushback Talks, we explored the motivations and experiences of these student activists, the challenges they faced, and the broader implications of their movement. We'll hear from Fabiola Villanueva, an undergraduate student at Columbia College studying political science and sustainable development, and a participant in the protest encampment, who will share her firsthand account of the occupation and the solidarity it sparked. We're also joined by Helena Hagland, a Swedish journalist reporting on the Middle East and North Africa, and a PhD candidate studying social movements and legacy media. Helena is actively involved in student and faculty groups supporting Palestine in both Chicago and Stockholm. Join us as we dive into the heart of these protests, uncover the stories behind the headlines, and discuss the enduring impact of this global movement. This is Pushback Talks. I'm Frederick Gerten, and I'm the filmmaker. And I'm Leilani Farha, and I'm the advocate. And here we are again, Pushback Talks. Uh, Leilani, we, sometimes we forget about this, the filmmaker and the advocate, but it's actually the two roles we have. I mean, you are a hell of an advocate and uh, I'm, I'm trying to make films. I mean, but it's... Uh... I think we're struggling. I think you're a struggling <laughs> documentary filmmaker. I'm a struggling advocate. But yeah, that's what we do. We're struggling. And uh, the last seven months has been intense for you uh, since... October 7th, and it's consuming a lot of your time. It's not your normal advocacy, is it, to, to fight for, no. for human I mean, rights in Palestine? No. I've always done some work in the occupied Palestinian territories, but this, of course, is unprecedented and has taken up a lot of both my practical time but my emotional energy as well, of course, of yeah. course, to watch this unfold. I remember you told me a few years ago that that your parents uh, didn't want you girls, you and your sisters, to to learn Arabic when you moved to Canada or when you were born in Canada because you shouldn't inherit the pain of being Palestinian or being being Arab. But now you you're it's it's got to you anyway. Yeah, I mean they they had a sense that once you engage in the issue of Palestinian liberation and struggle, that you will have a lifetime of woe and worry and upsetness. And they wanted to protect me and my three sisters from that. Um, of course, they couldn't because the politics were in the house. They were at the dinner table. <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, so they did and they didn't. You know, they sent us to schools, like private Anglican school and all of that, and didn't teach us Arabic. But... Um, uh, and I had the same with my children. How much am I going to bestow? You know, what am I, what am I going to tell them? How will it ruin their lives? <laughs> they both have my last name, so they're identifiable as Arabs. And, hmm. you know, it's a struggle. Yeah. My town, Malmo, has been in the center of, of the noise uh, with the, the, the finals of the Eurovision. Yes. And it's been quite intense. I never seen so many police in my lifetime. No one, I mean, with snipers on the roofs and and policemen with heavy arms, which we never see on the streets in Sweden. And of course, a very strong movement um, asking, you know, to kick out Israel from, the, from this competition. And of course, protesting the war on Gaza. So it's been, it's been intense, but it's also been beautiful. Because the, the the Palestinians and there are many in here in Malmo and 
they've been so proud, you know, suddenly they, everybody are seeing their, their suffering, their struggle. It's been quite beautiful and it's been extremely peaceful. It's been interesting. And there, were, there was like some little sit-ins in the streets here with the bigger, more radical group led by, or led by, but also joined by Greta Thunberg, the climate activist. So she is very, uh, she's very involved too. She's very brave mm. and, and she's out there. And today we're going to talk about the, the students and the young people of the United States and other places that are also joining into this protest and and I would say in some way we don't really know what is happening in the US but uh, we can we know something is cooking so we actually have invited an activist and student from Colombia in New York so welcome to pushback talks uh, Fabiola <laughs> thank you Frederick thank you Leilani tell me what is what is happening right now so right now the school year has ended, graduation ceremonies are underway. Um, however, the past month has been an unprecedented time at Columbia University. Uh, it all started many, many months ago when our student group Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voices for Peace uh, were suspended for um, allegedly uh, hosting unauthorized protests. And this just led to many, many months of administration just trying to suppress pro-Palestinian voices, which ended up escalating in the um, in the encampment that that sparked protests all around the U.S. and other world. So now we're kind of dealing with the aftermath of this movement and what it means for the wider um, public opinion, what it means for universities in Europe that are still having classes. And yeah, I mean, it's been an intense month for sure. So how is it to be in the middle of this? It's it's it, it's it's an historic event. I mean, we haven't seen anything like this on American campuses since the '60s. But what I understand, even more violent now, uh, all these years later. Mm -hmm. How is it to be a part of that? Well, it's both uh, disheartening to see our administration repeat um, their mistakes from the past. They did the same thing in the '60s. They did the same thing. In um, 85, when students were advocating against um, apartheid in South Africa, actually in the 60s, the administration response was more violent. However, the disciplinary legal charges were not as harsh, and the administration were actually able to meet with students in good faith and listen to their demands and meet them. What we're seeing now is that Columbia, as it is the same case with many colleges in the U.S., is that they're staying very strong in their position about not divesting from Israel. Um, but what we're seeing is that uh, the students are not backing down. And that's the most important part. It's been very intense, it's been very disheartening, but it's also been extremely inspiring to be in the middle of this and to see you know, a multi-race, uh, multi-faith, multi-generational movement take place just in front of our library on our own campus has been extremely inspiring, it's been I mean, it, it felt like we were making history. It just took a while to see that it was actually happening, right? So I think one thing that I will say is that being in the middle of it feels like having the spotlight on you, in a, in a, it, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad ways, right? Um, everyone wants to discredit the movement and, and label us as something we're not. But then also you have people like you guys and many others that recognize that what we're doing is uh, for the sake of humanity and for the sake of human dignity for all. Leilani. Mm. Well, I mean, obviously, it's just incredibly moving um, to see what students are doing, particularly at Columbia, because there was a way in which Columbia really emerged as the, the first uh, in the U.S. And um, what strikes me is... You know, you get into a place like Columbia, yeah? you're in high school, you're applying to all these universities, and you're like, Columbia, right? And you get in, and you're feeling pretty amazing, right? Like your future mm -hmm. is before you, and this is a, a gateway to so much. It's such a revered institution. You'll make incredible connections and networks and et cetera. And what strikes me is that by joining this movement uh, and being so strong and firm in it, it strikes me that you're willing to, all of these students seem willing to 
put aside what might have drawn them to Colombia in the first place. And I just wondered if you could speak about that. Did you have hesitations? Are you concerned? What does this mean for your future? I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give you a bit of, a, of my background as well. So I'm originally from Caracas, from Venezuela. Um, so I grew up amidst repression, amidst human rights violations. Um, all I wanted was to earn that right to protest and that right to speak up about what I thought about politics without being repressed. I eventually gained that when I moved to Spain. Uh, my family is originally from Spain, so I was able to do that. Um, I was able to participate in, in Fridays for Future and many climate protests and COP, etc. So I'm someone who does not take my right to protest lightly. It's something that I've, in a way, earned. It's something that I do not take for granted. So I actually applied to Colombia and I accepted my offer from Colombia because it was known as the, um, the activist Ivy, as the protest Ivy. I knew that I wanted to go somewhere where people would not be apolitical. And after coming to Colombia, I actually um, was put in a scholarship program that basically enrolled me in a not zero credit class, not graded uh, for the first year, for freshman year. And basically what this class entailed was um, teaching us students about the movements at Colombia in the past and teaching us about how the administration had made a mistake by not listening to the students. And I mean, it was just a year of learning about this. It was a year about learning uh, about the gentrification of Harlem by Columbia University. It was a year of learning about the uh, historic ties of Colombia to slavery. And then you, you wonder, why would students protest? when <laughs> their university is complicit in a genocide, right? So, I mean, it's, I think I'm not the only one that has um, this experience. I know that a lot of people at Columbia wanted to come to Columbia and, and New York, more especially because it's a diverse community, it's a vibrant community. It's somewhere where you know that wherever you stand on the political spectrum, you're supposed to have some sort of community that will back you up, right? So it's just been strange to grapple with the administration's response, knowing how how regretful they've been in the past to make these mistakes of, you know, jailing their students, calling the NYPD on their students, letting their students be brutalized. And now they boast about this um, activism uh, legacy. So I, I have no further comment. I think it's pretty self-explanatory that um, I think in 20, 30 years, Colombia will most likely come out again and say, well, you guys were right. I'm sorry. <laughs> but for now, what we're seeing is, you know, um, a lot of people are putting everything on the line. I'm a low-income student. I'm a full financial aid at Columbia University. Many are international students. Many are, yeah, fully dependent on on this education to really help them in their, in their future career uh, aspirations. And what we're seeing is that people keep putting that on the line. It's It hasn't been easy to be a protester at Columbia. There's constantly people try to take pictures of you, try to uh, dox you, as we say. So I think that the, yeah, the students of, of Colombia have been extremely brave with their activism. And even though people might call us cowards because we might be wearing masks or kafias, I just think it's a sign that we're both very ambitious students and activists, right? And we want to be able to do both in peace. That's really cool. And and I, I you can always see that this the campaigns, you know, smear campaigns against uh, activists is there again. And they will try to find some way of label you. They could label you as rich, spoiled kids. That's something we read. Rich, spoiled kids that are, they, they need a struggle in their life, <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of. That's one story. And of course, then the, the ones that is mostly repeated is that you're anti-Semitic, which is also very strange. And I saw this amazing uh, CNN inside uh, journalism from, um, from California the other day uh, where um, you could see that the people who are attacking the students were Israelis, uh, you know, very active, but also neo-Nazis who were being out, obviously also hating Jews who were now running with the Israeli flags. And actually yeah. here, also in Malmo, when we had, uh, there was a small Israeli uh, manifestation, uh, which was like peaceful and nice. But amongst them, there were also people I know who's been sentenced for smearing Jews. You know, so it's like this, cu the cultural war is also at play here, you know, which is, which is a weird 
Anyway, we have another guest uh, with us today, and that's uh, Helena Heglund, and she's a Swedish journalist, but she's also a PhD candidate uh, studying all this, the movement. So, Helena, welcome to Pushback Talks. Hi. Hi. Thank you. So you are in the midst of Chicago. You've been following the protest, but it's also because you're also studying movements. So what, what have you been seeing? So I've been uh, at the University of Chicago encampment quite a lot. Um, it's now, it was raided um, some days ago, but it stood for about a week and I visited that encampment every day. And I had actually planned a, a teach-in as well, but then it got raided. So uh, we'll have to see about what happens with that. So that encampment and also the preparations and all the activism beforehand here at University of Chicago has been uh, extraordinary it's been uh, it's been amazing to see actually so i so i'm a journalist as you mentioned and i've been working mainly in the middle east and i was covering the arab spring uh, for many years and the aftermath of the arab spring and it's quite fascinating to see a new wave uh, i mean and during the same time as the Arab Spring, we saw solidarity between uh, the encampments in Tahrir and Occupy encampments, you know, so it was quite a lot of global solidarity going on. And it's amazing for me to see that we have the sort of same thing going on now, where there's a international solidarity and it's a sort of talk, uh, it's a conversation between Palestine and uh, students abroad here in the U.S. and well, now in Sweden as well, because, right, Frederick, you know that just a couple of days ago we have encampments. Five, uh, five universities, we have encampments. Yeah, exactly. And and the, the Stockholm one is is also with Greta Thunberg participating. So it's it's also the, the another very strong youth movement involved in this, the, the, the climate uh, the climate struggle. So it's, it is bigger. Leilana, I can see that you want to say something. <laughs> I think what Helena just said about this global solidarity and the talk between mm. Palestinians and people yeah. in the West is so important. I was moved to tears as many others were, and I'm sure Columbia students were, when the Palestinian children in Rafa had made these signs, I can barely talk about it, thanking the Colombian students. And many of our listeners may not realize is how invisible Palestinians have been and feel. And this moment is so unbelievable, including to me, who grew up being embarrassed to be an Arab. I would never mention that I was Lebanese, let alone that we had familial ties to Palestine, no way. There was no way I would mention that growing up. And so this moment where Palestinians and their humanity is not just like a political issue and in the headlines, but being embraced by a Venezuelan who has no direct connection necessarily, as far as I know, to Palestine, it's... It is a remarkable thing and not to be um, underrepresented or undervalued because this is, I can tell you, I mean, everyone I talk to who's like really deeply in this, we're just like, whoa. I mean, for me to wear a keffiyeh on the street, I have some fear. I was in the United States and so I had some fear wearing it. But also, I mean, I've been wearing a keffiyeh since I was a child. Like we had them at home. Mm. To just wear it, it's a moment. And for these Palestinians... In Rafa, I mean, yeah. Fabiola. I mean, yeah, I just wanted to um, refer to what Leilani was saying about the global solidarity. Something we saw a lot in the encampment was uh, we had teachings from people that were not Palestinian. Let's say what they were from Kashmir. They Let's say they were from Korea. We saw, uh, and I cannot stress enough, we saw a multi-race, multi-ethnicity, multi-faith movement just... It's, it was like a utopia, you know? We had a lawn where you had Passover celebrations, you had a mass, you had Muslims also praying and, you know, Christians covering up the Muslim women. And then you also had, I think there was a lot of emphasis on how your personal identity brought you to the encampment. So I saw a lot of like Latinos for Palestine, Puerto Ricans for Palestine. So other than just, you know, denouncing the the most basic thing you know the, there are children there are innocents dying because of this 
there's also another layer to it, which is I have seen the same struggle in my people. And even if you haven't, you're able to see that this is not okay, right? But a lot of people bring their own struggles and we say something a lot of that is our, our struggles are all connected. Um, and I think that's also a beautiful part of this movement. I, 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 I talked to um, a Swedish Chilean rapper and he said, Frederick, you should know that what is happening now is for us what South Africa and anti-apartheid was for you, you know? So it's for a young generation also over here, it, this is now a very, very strong issue, strong moral issue. So Helena, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you see this? Because this is also, for me, it's also connecting Black Lives Matter. It connects other struggles that has been bringing people together. Yeah, so I can just start with saying that here at Chicago, so, so okay, we have the big global sort of movements and the sort of connections people have to all over the world uh, and how do, how they feel about Palestine, but also what the, these encampments are doing, at least here in uh, at UChicago, like we're based here, UChicago is based on the south side of Chicago, uh, like in a very poor, it's a poor neighborhood, very, a lot of viol violent uh, crimes here. And a lot of police, um, and Chicago is also known for its sort of police brutality and surveillance. And what people are doing here at this encampment is also inviting in the local community to the encampment, talking about police surveillance, about police violence, and connecting that. What's happening here in the south side of Chicago is also, it's part of the same system uh, as militarization and the police brutality in um, in Israel, because the, the police are like, um, uh, you know, working together and uh, getting educated in the same programs or whatever. So I think that like bringing together these small local communities with these bigger global struggles that it is, um, it's so, it's very interesting to see. And um, I mean, it's not just this, but we also see the, the land back movement has been very active in the question for Palestine, right? And uh, like I said, so Jesse Jackson was here at the encampment talking to the students. So it's a, it's about, it's a continuation of Black Lives Matter and sort of longer civil, civil rights uh, movement issue and the land back movement and like you said also the environmental movement and also uh, not to forget the movement the progressive Jewish movement that's really exploding at the moment. So that's also a big part of this, uh, like a change of the Jewish sort of identity um, here in the States. Which is also very visible here in, in Sweden too. Yeah. Mm. But but it is to, in Sweden, I think, like, it's always different. There's big differences, I think, in in Europe and in the States because the, the, the Jewish community here in the States is so much bigger and much more diverse uh, than it will always be harder for like say German German Jewish communities or, or Swedish ones. They're so much smaller. Uh, yeah, so it's, but, but it's, um, it's interesting to see, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. but some of the strongest voices criticizing Israel right now are, are Jewish voices also over here, yeah. so. Yeah. So, which is which is very interesting. Um, yeah, I, we, I mean, we call this podcast pushback talks because we like to to share inspiration of people pushing back. And in my last film, Breaking Social, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's also very much about people who who take a step from passive to be active to fight back. And and I think what you can see is that inspiration is flying. And this is what you, I mean, you started in Colombia and now how many universities are, are doing this around the US and how many in Canada and, and around Europe and, you know, in Australia. I mean, it's, it's, it's suddenly you are, Fabiola, you're part of a global movement. Sure. How do you feel about that? I mean, as I was saying, I, it's amazing. I mean, I, it's amazing when you when you see that solidarity, when you see that global solidarity. Of course, it's not amazing to see what's still going on in Palestine despite this movement. But I do think we're seeing a significant turning point in in foreign policy in general. Uh, of course, the U.S. is still you know uh, is continuing with the arms deals to Israel, 
But I do think that, you know, in the UN, we're seeing the resolution to, to ensure Palestinian statehood. And that moment when I kind of woke up and saw that headline, that's when I was like, okay, now we're talking, right? And it's just, I think, you know, having studied a lot of the civil rights movements, having studied the anti-apartheid movement and having been part of the environmental movement at its peak 2019, 2020, around that time, um, I had never felt so visibilized in a way, I think. And I just truly do think that it's, it's I mean, it's what Elena was talking about. There's, there's so many ways to connect those local issues to, you know, just a strip in the Middle East. And it's, you can connect it to so many complex structures of power and you can connect it to international law. And you can connect it to all these fancy things. But then at the end of the day, you can also just say, well, morally, at the base of my heart, I don't think that civilians dying, thousands of civilians dying, is is correct in any way, right? And I also do think that it's a, you know, it's a global movement for liberation, yes. But what we're seeing, I think, is just also a movement up for education. You know, it's not only teaching people that the history of the occupied Palestinian territories did not start on October 7th. But it's also teaching people of of the history of, of occupation, not only in Palestine, but all, all around the world and the systems of oppression that keep making, you know, separating the world into two, basically. And I mean, I do think this movement will not will not stop. I mean, that's one of our mottos. We will not stop. We will not rest. And even though we have push, uh, we have seen pushback from administration, we have seen pushback from uh, legal authorities. I think that's a sign that this is working, right? And if you if you have any type of um, of experience with activism, if you have any type of experience with risky protesting, quote unquote, you know that this is a sign that discrediting is a sign of no no right argument against what the movement is truly about. And while it's you know it's sad and and, and it's misguided to label us as anti-Semitic or any sort of thing like that, which I'm sure you can see just by seeing who are our leaders, that that is not the case. I think that's, that overall, the solidarity that we're getting from the whole world is just a sign that that this will not stop, and that we will we'll see a see we will see a free Palestine within our lifetime. Helena, uh, I just yeah, what, exactly what you were saying, Fabiola. I think that we need to. So um, I study media from like from a hegemony perspective and what it's always important to remember that whenever we see this kind of like violence and this tough pushback and this like, yeah, you know, with the brutality, that always implies a he hegemony shift, right? Because you don't need that if like you don't need to use violence if status quo mm -hmm. is not challenged, right? Mm -hmm. So... I think that that is very important to always keep in mind, exactly. to just like take a breath and like, okay, so what we're seeing now is a shift and that is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, I, I saw from my own dorm window, just hundreds of police uh, in riot gear. And I saw the SWAT team come to Columbia University, a site that I would never imagine. Right. And that's one of those moments, right, that I was like, well, if you're calling in hundreds and hundreds of police in riot gear and the SWAT team and the counterterrorism unit on a bunch of, you know, 110 pound queer women from Barnard singing Kumbaya, <laughs> what does this mean, right? Like, wh what are you so afraid of? At the end of the day, we're just a bunch of college students from all around the world, from all types of backgrounds literally just coming together and chanting and, and learning from each other and just feeding each other, praying with each other, playing music for each other. I mean, the encampment was just a utopia. So yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It's a, it's a complete hegemony shift. Mm. And I think also the morals are quite easy to understand. You know, you don't need to, to study 2,000 years of, of history somewhere. You can just say it's, it's wrong to do what Israel is doing exactly. right now. It's it's very easy to so say. You can, of course, also say that it was wrong of Hamas to do what it did October 7th. You can you can have a lot of positions at the same time. But, uh, but I mean, it's the moral is easy. And I I think that this is, in some way, for me, the future of the movement is to, to keep the morals high because you're fighting a right wing that has no morals 
and they are lying and you know it's like it's it's they are so horrible so i think the uh, we should be the one who show the bigger moral we don't need to to their their bullshit language their aggressive bully language we we can be mm-hmm. we can sing kumbaya i think that's fine you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh, mm. and we should keep inspiring each other i think that's extremely important and and help each other not to feel lonely because it's easy to feel lonely Leilana, you said the Palestinians felt lonely. Now they feel less lonely in some ways, which is kind mm. of, which is a gift created by, by you, your your people in in, in Colombia, but also the people in Chicago, in LA, in Malmo, in many cities around the world. I mean, if you don't mention Latin America or Africa, where everybody, I mean, I've been in both continents late uh, recently, and it, I. I mean, it's very clear what people think. They recognize colonialism, mm-hmm. and that's kind of should be outdated. The double standards of human rights. What do you say, Leilani? <laughs> yeah, I have a, a lot of thoughts because a lot has been said. But um, I think you know, you're a documentary filmmaker, Frederick. You deal in images, and I think the images are telling the moral story. I mean, the images are stark. It's what Faviola said. You're seeing these students and they're dancing and even when they're being harassed, many of the students are like calm in face. These young faces we're seeing who are being discriminated against, being labeled anti-Semitic. This, the young girl who was denied, young woman who was denied the right to give the valedictorian speech at the California University and USC. And you look at her, And there she is, like, you know, she's wearing her hijab and she's like just this shining beacon of the future Mm. being silenced. You have Palestinians. I mean, the images are, I can't even go there. I mean, I, I, they're horrific, right? And then we're seeing images of bombs and the bombing of buildings and the, et cetera. And so, and, and if you look at the uh, pro-Israel protesters, they're being violent and they have anger in their faces and, it's all being revealed, like just through images. Mm-hmm. I find, I find that heartening because images are so strong for people, especially in this day and age. But one of the things that I think, one of the secondary conflicts, or maybe it's a primary conflict that is not resolved, is this one that Helena raised around media. And I, I have never been a consumer of mainstream media, especially on this issue. I just simply refuse. It's too upsetting. I've lived a life of avoidance of mainstream media on this particular issue. And I've had quite a few quarrels with the largest newspaper in Canada around their coverage and uh, uh, their bias, their anti-Palestinian racism. And so I think this is a continued tension, this uh, and you look at I watch I do watch some of those U.S. state media in, uh, interactions. What I do find is as things get worse and worse, and it's amazing that it's even getting like can a genocide get worse? Apparently, it can. As it's getting worse, I think we are starting to see it's almost like a parody, like American politicians, Biden, Blinken, they all seem like a parody of a politician. Mm-hmm. The the clinging to colonial power is very clear right now. As Fabiola said, bringing in these hundreds of police officers, it you see this desperate clinging to the colonial settler power. And so to me, that's becoming very stark, but will it break in the media? I don't know yet. It's up to us, but I think you you guys do a great job. We are quite soon wrapping up. Helena? Yeah, well, I mean, I can't stay quiet if someone's talking about the media. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's like what I do, uh, yes. what I study, and what I've been doing my whole career as well, journalism. But so I think that it's um, from what I'm seeing now is one of the like the best uh, media scholars that I know uh, is actually like is a professor. He used to be he's dead now, but he used to be at Columbia, Todd Gitlin, and he has this book that's very meaningful for anyone who st- studies uh, protest movements and media. And in his book, he lists um, the way that legacy media uh, portrays movements, and he studied the New Left, also like a student movement then. And he he saw that uh, like 
the coverage is always negative media coverage of uh, of social movements and that it tend to uh, portray protesters as as um, degenerates as violent as um, they emphasize counter protests mm -hmm. they talk to passerbyers those are things that he um, sees in the media coverage and they never talk to to the protesters themselves about why they are protesting. Oh, and this great. is, you know, this book is, he published this book, 1980. And this is exactly the same thing we are seeing every day now, the exact same things, mm. focusing on violence, never talking to the protesters themselves. And I think that this is, it's still going on the same thing. Yeah. I just can I, I just want to add Frederick mm. to that because it's so important what Helena just said. To add to it, that narrative of the protester as angry and violent and uh, you know gets conflated with anti-Palestinian racism where Palestinians or anyone who supports them are violent terrorists, et cetera. And so I think that's really, th those two things are being conflated, right? That generally protesters are bad and anyone who's Palestinian or pro-Palestinian is going to be violent and a terrorist and supporting terrorists, right? But you can, you can also hear yeah. the stories about uh, stop oil in the UK or extinction rebellions. You will hear the same kind of spin. So it's not only here you know and but of course Nelson Mandela was also labeled a terrorist so I mean it's it, the history is full of these examples so but wow I, I was it was really happy to have both of you on pushback talks and and uh, Leilani and I promised ourselves not to make too long episodes because <laughs> we think people will get tired. Tune out. And I also remember now that Kirsten told me to say that people have to rate the show because that's really important. And of course, tell the friends about Pushback Talks. It's out on all platforms. What more should they do, Leilani? I don't know, but we can we can tell our listeners that we have been recognized for our, I don't know, our, our weekly, monthly, whatever, uh, episodes through, what's it called? Good Pods. No, Good Pods. Yes. We are ranked on the top 100 list. We were ranked. That's right. <laughs> I have no idea what it means, but me neither. No, sounds good though. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll but, take any recognition. We do this for free. Yeah. We do it for love, not money. But we have uh, listeners so far in 161 countries, so the voice, your voice, will travel to many places. That's yes, like and e even more places because now we're on YouTube as well. Exactly, and now we're also on YouTube, so we are also modern. <laughs> Sorry. Amazing, Helena, Fabiola, to have you here to listen to your... And I mean, the luxury we have is to also see your smiles. I think yes. <laughs> the smiles are also an important uh, weapon in, in this uh, struggle. We, we need to keep smiling because they are not. And I think yes. that's, uh, that's really important. So thank you for all. And Leilani, next week or next time, we're going to have a very prominent guest. Can you tell us about... The guest we're going to have. Yes, we're, we are um, going to be speaking with the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN, which is the top human rights job. And uh, it's a very interesting time right now in light of our conversation today to be talking to the top dog on human rights. Volker Türk, and he made a, actually a statement about the, your protest, Fabiola. He said that you have mm. the right to speak. The students have the right to speak. So he came out in support mm. of you, and now he's also joining us in Pushback Talks. That's cool. I will definitely listen. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> That's cool. And Fabiola, if you, and maybe Elena, if you would like to organize a screening of my film in, at your, where you are about, tell me, because it's very much about fighting back. The film so it's a, perfect it's a, it will also leave you with some smiles yeah now i'm gonna go and tune in to the international court of justice hearing south africa has gone back to demand more leilani i was gonna do the same thing <laughs> <laughs> i'll see you there it's an interesting time to to want to study international law exactly oh. <laughs> uh, leilani today in vancouver i'm in malmo and helena in chicago and fabiola in new york city so why that's cool. We're together and let's push back. See you soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Pushback Talks is produced by WG Film. 
To support the podcast, become a patron by going to patreon.com slash pushback talks. Follow us on social media at make underscore the shift and push underscore the film. Or check out our websites, maketheshift.org, pushthefilm.com, or breakingsocialfilm.com.